You wanna be, be my Valentine, Miss Lily? Oh. Nice. You're a good girl. You're my Valentine. You look very pretty today. Happy Friday, Baylor College of Medicine and friends of Baylor. So it's Q&A time. Now let me explain how Q&A works. There are three piles. I get a lot of questions, and so I put them in three piles. The ones that are very easy to answer, I try to answer those first. The ones that are very difficult to answer, I usually put those off, and so we're going to do those today. And of course, the third pile, questions from my sister and her friends. <laughs> Who can figure those out? Uh, very few of those this week, but a lot of really tough ones. So we'll, first, I want to just go through what's going on in the world, because some interesting things. First of all, Germany has scrapped its mandate uh, for uh, masks on long distance travel. So that's, that's new. Uh, because of the big outbreak in China, which of course is not being reported, the CDC is working on uh, looking for new variants among travelers, which is interesting. And of course, now that we're all resting and happy because COVID is doing better, What's on the horizon? Well, uh, unfortunately, a mutant H5N1, this is old bird flu, it has been detected in a mink farm in Spain. Remember, minks seem to be very susceptible to these respiratory viruses. And early on, we talked about an outbreak, an outbreak of SARS-CoV-2 in mink. Well, they're at it again. Only this time, it's H5N1. The problem is it seems to be spreading among minks. So a lot of times, these avian flu viruses will um, uh, we'll get into mink, you know, minks one at a time, but not have transmission between them. That's a little bit scary because it's mammalian trans transmission. When we've had, uh, we've always been afraid that there might be a big uh, pandemic with H5N1, but it's so high mortality, almost 50% of the people who get the disease die from the disease. It hasn't really spread, it hasn't spread uh, between people, but big concern. The good news is we have a lot of vaccination opportunities. We have a way to be prepared. Of course, people have to start believing in vaccines uh, and vaccination because we may very well need it if we're facing another global pandemic, this time with a more virulent virus, uh, H5N1. So good news in the United States. Uh, you know, we never really had that big winter surge that everybody was uh, predicting or concerned about. Things are getting better, case numbers falling, hospitalizations are decreasing by about 20% over the last two weeks. And there's been a significant decline in hospitalizations, just over 30,000 people down from what was high of about 50,000 in January. And deaths are hovering right around 470 to 80 per day. But just think back one year ago, we were over 2,500 deaths per day. So a lot of, a lot of very good news. Test positivity is beginning to tick up, and so is wastewater nationally, which makes me a little bit concerned uh, that we'll see you know, a little bit of a tick up as we uh, get to the spring. On the downside, still just 5% of children between the ages of two and four have gotten their primary series of vaccinations, and only 15.7% of Americans have gotten their, their boosters. So, you know, with all these pandemic threats around us and ones in the future, we better get our acts together. We can't be pretending this is all going to go. This isn't just a COVID thing. This is going to be happening time and time again. So before we get to Q&A, I just want to mention a few things. I mentioned case numbers are down very dramatically. Uh, hospitalizations are down. This is the concern I have about wastewater. If you look at it, wastewater is beginning to tick up. And in Texas, we're doing pretty well. Dimmick County is low. Harris County is still moderate. In the Texas Medical Center, we're continuing to see the trend of decreases in hospitalizations, wastewater, and everything. And the dominant strain is the XBB 1.5. It's up to about 65% nationwide. All right, let's get right to the difficult questions I've been putting off for a long time. So these are, a lot of these are from faculty members. So this is a faculty member asked, I saw in the news an article about imprinting of the immune system in COVID. Can you explain what all that's about? So this was a, a phenomenon observed really with flu viruses that if you were, got infected with a flu virus, you, your, your immune system responded in a particular way to the various parts of that flu virus. So when you got a new flu viral strain the next year, your body didn't respond quite as well. It sort of just amplified the previous version of the, the, um, uh, the virus and not the, it didn't respond as well as it could have to the new version. So there's some studies in nature uh, that have suggested this is kind of happening with uh, SARS-CoV-2. And here's a good example, an illustration. 
uh, in, in Nature Reviews. If you can see, this is a patient who gets infected with the original Wuhan strain. And this array of little dots represents all the antibodies they generate to all different parts of the virus. Whereas this person didn't get it and got infected with Delta. And you can see it's a slightly different pattern. Well, if you get you know, this first person who got in, in, infected with the Wuhan original isolate gets in, uh, a virus, gets a vaccine with that original strain, it amplifies those of the red dots. Very strong response to the original one. Whereas if this person was infected with Alpha, they got reinfected with Delta, very different. So just look at the colors. Very strong red response, that's the original spike protein, and very different response based on these other infections, suggesting that that's in part why we have differential responses to the virus. So it's a form of imprinting based on what your immune system has been uh, exposed to, you'll have a different antibody response. So that's a complicated question, but it seems to be one of the important phenomena that's been described. Another interesting paper was in Nature Reviews by Eric Topol looking at the mechanisms of long COVID. So a lot of discussion and debate, why do you get low co long COVID? So it's, as we talked about in the last couple of weeks, you know, as many as 10%, now it's down to probably 5%, but more than 200 symptoms have been attributed to long COVID. And there's about a, a bunch of explanations. Some are persistent reservoirs of the virus. Some are immune dysregu dysregulation. Some are, uh, have suggested that there's a, a stimulation of other intrinsic viruses, uh, such as Epstein-Barr virus or human herpes virus. And there were a couple of papers this week showing that. Uh, and so there's the uh, potential that the SARS-CoV-2 impacts your microbiome. Uh, so there's a lot of different explanations, and we don't yet know what the, what the uh, cause is, but still a lot of work going on. That's why there's a lot of studies going on on long COVID. So here's a, a good question. Is Paxlovid effective against the new strain XBB 1.5? There really isn't any data on this right now, but all of the previous uh, antivirals, remdesivir, Paxlovid, and Molnupiravir, uh, are all expected to be uh, uh, useful for, um, for XBB 1.5. The problem really is that Paxlovid isn't being uh, prescribed enough. So, you know, only in about half the cases that are eligible are doctors prescribing Paxlovid, uh, and in some cases, very, very rarely prescribed in some parts of the country. And that's a shame because uh, it is effective even in people who were vaccinated but um, infected. Uh, so, there was a question are vaccines actually fueling COVID variants? Is it making it worse? Well, it's not, I mean, it's not a bad question. Uh, vaccines, just because what we talked about are imprinting your um, immune system, can drive uh, evolution of the virus. But if you look at the evolution of the virus we're seeing, it's becoming less and less virulent, not more and more virulent. So it is true that vaccines will sort of box in uh, viral evolution, but it's not, there's no evidence that it's making it worse. Uh, this is a, a good one. There, there is... Is there real evidence that the COVID uh, bivalent booster increases the protection of having severe case? What do we know about the effectiveness? Well, we had, there had been a lot of data, but the uh, CDC just reported on a, a big uh, study that showed that the bivalent mRNA booster provided added protection against symptomatic infection during the three months after vaccination. So and it's, it's, it seems to be adding uh, protection. So there is some new data that suggests that it's at least doing it for the first three or four months. That's specifically for infection, not for uh, how serious illness, because we know it's very effective at, against preventing serious illness. Who should get a COVID booster now? Uh, well, based on, you know, based on all of the data, if you're at high risk or you're over the age of 50, you should get a, you should get a booster. If you haven't had a booster in the last six months and you're over the age of 50, to me, I would just go ahead and get one because it really does prevent uh, serious illness. So this is one I, I almost hate to address because it comes, it was in Twitter, it was mostly on Twitter. The Cleveland Clinic, it's a strange uh, uh, study, suggested that three doses of the vaccine are worse than two. And it, this is a classic example of, of a study that doesn't have controls uh, and is difficult to interpret. So, you know, if you look at, the study indicates that the risk of infection is higher after three vaccines than two doses, than two doses. That doesn't make any intri intrinsic sense. So let's look at that more deeply. It wasn't peer reviewed, it's not controlled study. It showed also that if you got more vaccines, you were protected from serious illness. So those things seem to be contradictory. Well, why would you find that three is worse than two? 
There's a lot of data that's missing. That's one big problem. So in a peer-reviewed study, uh, the reviewers are likely to say, well, you're missing data on a lot of people, so you can't really reach that conclusion. And then the other one is a giant selection bias. So testing was optional. So who gets tested? People who, who are obsessive, who want to get tested all the time, those are the same people who get more vaccinations, and they're more likely to uh, uh, report symptoms. So I think it really is a selection bias problem, and I think the reviewers of the study will pick it up. I doubt it will be published in, in its current uh, state, and I don't think it's a real finding. So this is another one. I've, I, these are difficult to, to answer. Someone wrote, you know, a recently leaked, I think this was on the internet, and a recently leaked interview of Pfizer's Director of Research and Development uh, said that Pfizer is manipulating the structure of the, of the spike protein uh, to see whether or not it can make it more virulent. Well, I went back and looked at the interview, and that, though those, the comments are really taken out of context. What they're saying is that, uh, and we've talked about this, there are only so many confirmations pr that, the, that the spike protein can probably be in to bind to the receptor binding domain. And so there, there's a limited number of confirmations. If you could create a vaccine against all those confirmations, you could really be effective. That could be interpreted by someone saying, oh, you want to mutate the virus to make it less effective. But I don't, that's not what he was saying. So that's just, a, again, a, an, inter, an internet rumor. Why do we need more COVID vaccines? Well, that's a good question. The, the virus keeps evolving and it obviously evading some of our immune responses. But think about the problems we have. There are a lot of variants. There's a lack of durability of the, of the vaccine. It only lasts about six to nine months, as best we can tell. It doesn't generate that IgA response for mucosal immunity to prevent transmission, so people still get infected even if they don't get sick. Uh, and it's you know, difficult to store. The mRNA vaccines have to be stored at very cold temperatures, hard to distribute. And there's, not a lack, there's sort of a lack of broad protection. We just keep chasing one mutation after another. So there's plenty of reason um, to get uh, new vaccines. Uh, can we get ahead of viral evolution? Well, this is sort of an answer to the previous two questions. That's the idea. The idea is to figure out a vaccine that can get ahead of the, the uh, viral ev evolution. And there are a couple of important studies going on. One, there are two groups, one at uh, the University of Washington and one at Caltech, that are creating mosaic vaccines. So there's an array of nanoparticles and putting a variety of different structures of the, vi of the viral spike protein on it. Those are second generation vaccines, may be very effective. We'll have to wait and see. Uh, and I've mentioned uh, the work by the, the folks at Duke looking at uh, broad neutralizing and some other, other um, vaccine strategies. Do COVID nasal vaccines work? We, there are five approved, none uh, in the United States. Uh, there's two in China, one in India, uh, one in Iran, and one in Russia. We don't know their effectiveness yet, but in theory they should work, and hopefully we'll get one eventually in the U.S. Um, this is a great one. Who will we ever know when it's okay to unmask and go about our day? I put my seatbelt on every day and I drive. I feel like we don't have a COVID seatbelt yet. Well, that's a, you know, that's a good question. And the reality is if you've, take, if you've gotten five shots and you've gotten your flu shot, you're doing everything you can. I would feel pretty comfortable at this point going around without a mask. In fact, I usually do. That said, if you're going to be in a large group of people and you're worried about getting infected, wear a mask. Wear, masks are effective, so go ahead and do it. But I think you can, if you're vaccinated, you're, you've got your seatbelt on if you've been vaccinated. One person asked, I'm diabetic. Uh, I've not gotten COVID. I've heard that uh, I've taken metformin for my diabetes. Does that prevent infection? So the answer is there's no evidence, really, that metformin uh, induces, prevents, uh, protects you independently. There's some good data that well-controlled diabetics do better than poorly controlled diabetics. So if metformin's helping you control your diabetes, that's probably true. Uh, one question was, are the large number of deaths actually due to COVID? So yes and no. In the first peak, you can see this, excess deaths is how we really know. This is sort of historic levels of, of mortality. And this is what happened with the big surge. Those are almost certainly COVID related. But we're seeing now in this new, new period, sort of excess deaths, but there's another little, they call it in this article, excess, excess deaths. And there are more and more people who are now beginning to, to have problems from the diseases they're not taking care of. Cardiovascular disease, diabetes, cancer screening. 
So there are some increase in deaths that are really from lack of, of care that we need to make sure. If you, you know, don't forget that you're a, a person that needs to be followed up on other things besides COVID. And we are seeing an increase in cancer deaths and things like that from failure to screen. Um, this is uh, it's kind of an interesting one. Could uh, this has been in the newspaper a lot? Could uh, molnupiravir produced by Merck actually be supercharged in the pandemic? Why is that? That's because the way this this antiviral works is it induces mutations in the virus, and in th the idea is well, it kills the virus. Frankly, in some countries where they've seen some variants where there's a high use of this drug, it's a bit concerning. So frankly, I would not be using this drug. It's not been taken off the market, but there's no reason to produce it, to use a drug that produces a lot of mutations. Seems like it would be potentially counterproductive. And finally, my favorite question of all, does, hair, does, uh, does COVID cause hair loss? <laughs> well, you know, I don't know. Uh, people who get viral illnesses sometimes uh, have hair loss, and so yes, uh, you could have hair loss from an acute uh, exposure to SARS-CoV-2. In that case, what happens is your hair is a living organ. It continues to grow and your hair follicle goes into sort of a, a dormancy and people lose hair. It's not like male pattern baldness where it doesn't go into dormancy, it just gives up. It's like, I can't take it anymore. I'm not growing any more hair. So the people who do lose hair with an acute SARS-CoV-2 infection are likely to regrow that once they're months are better. So I want to end today with a most important shout out. Happy Valentine's to everybody on Tuesday. Lily and I wish you the best. Uh, she's got her Valentine's dress on. We're very excited about that. And of course, uh, congratulations to the Super Bowl winner, whoever that might be. <laughs> and I don't care about either one of them. So have a great weekend. I can't wait to see you next week.